approaching the city of Bombay, the gateway to India. And the first view that comes to our attention is the gate itself, an admirable illustration of Great Britain's constructive influence. Bombay is the second largest city of India and one of the chief seaports of the Orient. It has a mixed population of over one million people, representing practically every race and creed in the world. Taj Mahal Hotel is unquestionably the most pretentious one in all of India. One of the outstanding features of Bombay is its sudden transitions from the modern to the ancient. This scene, for example, was taken a few minutes from the heart of the city, where the 15th century is constantly rubbing shoulders with the 20th. These automobiles cutting into this line of ancient vehicles suggest an odd symbolism which typifies all of India, for time and time again, the new cuts into the old, for the gap is soon filled in, and the ancient procession goes on in strange defiance. At the famous race course in Bombay, we are again transported into another world, for here is gathered representatives of every nationality, creed, and color. The course itself is considered to be the most picturesque, if not the finest in the Orient. We are particularly interested in the costumes worn by the Parsi women. The Parsis are the descendants of exiled Persians. The entire Parsi population now numbers over 50,000, most of whom are residents of Bombay. They are regarded as the wealthiest class in India, and they are obviously the most progressive. Owing to its central position between the east and west, no city can show a greater variety of types than Bombay. Here we find gathered Parsi merchants, Arab traders, Afghans, and Sikhs, Chinese, Japanese, Malayans, Americans, and British, all part of the cosmopolitan crowds, so characteristic of Bombay. Not far from the racetrack, we come upon an old Indian faker with the cleverest little bird that we have ever seen. We will pause a while and watch this little fellow perform. work is just to get a little seed that is lodged in a tiny bucket. Stringing beads is the most amazing thing that this bird does. A needle is fastened to one end of the thread. The bird actually sticks the needle through a bead, drops the needle, gets a new grip, and slides the bead down onto the thread. much more to see and our time is limited. So we will leave this little bird with his beads and continue on to a picturesque fishing village just a short distance from Bombay. This quaint little habitation seems to have no connection with the mainland and life in general appears to be carried on quite apart from the outside world. All the people who live here are engaged in the fish industry and as strange as it may seem, many of them are strict vegetarians and therefore will not eat fish of any kind.
even in this peaceful little village, there is a rigid system of caste. Here we find two attractive young ladies of the proud fisher folk class. The dress each is wearing is called a sari. It is a one-piece garment which unwinds to about eight yards in length. Look closely at these young ladies and you will see a round dot in the center of their foreheads. This dot, which is usually made of red paint, signifies that the wearer is married or eligible for marriage. The flower pot before which they are standing contains the sacred Tulsi plant, an emblem of virtue, which is worshipped exclusively by Indian girls. The story goes that a certain virtuous maiden named Tulsi was changed into a plant just as she was about to be assaulted by a demon. Thus, the Tulsi plant became a shrine of chastity for virtuous Indian girls. The chief occupation for the women of this village is in drying and preparing the fish which is caught by the men. The method for treating the fish is to first soak them in salt and then lay them out on the sun-baked ground. When they are thoroughly dry, they are tied in small bundles and sent to market. These women are treating a smaller species of shrimp, which is swept about in this manner until it is sufficiently salted and dried. It is then used in preparing the famous Indian curry. No picture of India could possibly be complete without a view of its royal elephants on parade. the wealth of India and the splendor of the days that used to be. This is just a rare and special occasion staged by one of the wealthy Maharajas at a grand social event. The headpieces worn by these elephants are made of solid gold and are studded with magnificent jewels. But now our journey is coming to an end. We will take one last look at Bombay before we draw our visit to a close. To the observing tourists, this view is more than just a picture. It is Bombay, the gateway to India. Through it flows the commerce of an empire. Great commercial houses, stately public buildings, and educational institutions flank its broad thoroughfares. Railways converge here from every state in India, and steamship routes diverge to the ends of the earth. Such has been the first constructive imprint of Western civilization upon this much talked of and generally misunderstood country. And so our journey ends. We bid farewell to Bombay, the gateway to India.